we've been speaking about fruit. We've been speaking about fruit. The, two weeks ago, I spoke out of the Old Testament on fruitfulness. This week, we're going to look at the New Testament on fruitfulness. And the whole thing is based on what? what are we, what's our main subject right now? Identity. Yeah. Identity. Do you know your identity is fruitful? If you don't feel fruitful, you need to work on your identity. Who are we? Because God considers us fruitful. That's who we are. And we're going to talk about being fruitful. And we need help to know who we are because the world's mixed up about who we are. We've talked about that almost every week. The world is totally mixed up about who we are. We don't know our gender anymore. God gave us two genders, and we, somehow we think there's over a hundred genders. I'm not even tried to study that. <laughs> How on earth do logical, sensible people come up with a hundred genders? Only when we walk away from God do we get this confused. And uh, I think I saw where 900 and some records have been lost in the women's competitions and sports that are now owned by men. Gender men who say they are identifying as a woman. You know, that's one thing. If, if, a, if, if, say, a man wants to say, I'm more comfortable in dressing up like a woman, but I hope he still knows he's a man. But when we start saying, if a man decides that they're more comfortable in dressing like a woman, that suddenly that makes them a woman. How many of you know, it doesn't matter what the doctor does, it doesn't matter what the operation does, it doesn't matter how many drugs you give them, the male is still the male. You can only cover it up. You know, you, you, A hundred years from now, if they dig up a grave and they test a person out, it doesn't matter if it has a girl's name on the tombstone. The scientist is going to say, oh, they've misidentified. This is, this is a male. Oh, it must be during that time we were crazy. <laughs> it's sad that we've gotten to the place that instead of helping somebody who is going through that type of confusion, there are people that go through that for all kinds of reasons. I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who's willing to talk that we don't find out what is some of the characteristics that creates the confusion. But we're not allowed to help them anymore. You have to, matter of fact, pat them on the back and say, oh, you're a pioneer, you're a hero. Uh, And we cheer. And, uh, you know, I, I saw a man in a dress the other day sing a, a song about being a woman. And then when it got done, talked to all the women out there and says, and for all of us women, oh, he's, he's a man. Yet he's talking and identifying that, that he's a woman. And we're finding out, we get a little bit more sense when we say, oh, my dear, but when this person that we identify as a woman gets into women's sports, we find out they're, they're, they're overtaking and taking over all the, the things. And can you imagine that we've gone crazy enough to say the man dressed up as a woman is now the woman who's the fastest runner. He's now the woman who's the fastest swimmer. That he is now the woman who... You know, I, I remember when, when the man who wanted to be called Amy Snyder, goes on Jeopardy. And now he is the he is the woman who's the only woman who's made it in the top five winners of Jeopardy. Well, it's not a woman. But he's being identified as a woman. So you women finally got smart enough and it took a man to do it. You see? Come on. They say it. That's what they're saying. Finally, you women finally made it. It just took a man to get in a dress to make it happen. Do you see how insane that is? How disrespectful that is? How illogical that is? And why are, why are we doing it with agreeance and, and cheering and, and we all accept our own momentary insanity? And instead of helping people, 
We just go along with it. What, what ha- how does that happen when we throw God out of the equation? When we say God tells us there's only two, it's male and female. God says right in the word, he says, don't, don't let the men dress up as women and don't let the women dress up as men. And we slowly have disagreed with that. And look what happens as we disagree with it more and more. It's getting worse and worse, isn't it? Because it's just a joke. Maybe it's the comedian getting in a woman's dress. Maybe it's, remember Milton Berle and all that stuff they used to do. But it was promoting a world we were headed to. And at first you laugh at it. And so people know there's something wrong with a man being with a man as with a woman. We know that, but we got to laugh at it. So we do three's company. We make a guy who's a comedian act like he's gay. But in reality, we always knew we're rejecting God's way. God told us that's not how we should do. So instead of uh, just being accepting and, and, and pushing people into those realms, we ought to help them understand who God says you are. The only way I can change something is if God says I've been changed. And he did say in the Bible about a change, that I went from darkness to the kingdom of light. That is a change that we can promote. That is a change. It's very hard for us to agree with God on that one. Because we want to say, and we do, I'm just a sinner. Where God turns and says, oh, you used to be. You used to be identified as a sinner. I don't identify you that anymore. What does he say? If any man be in Christ, he is a Ooh, old things. All things have become new. All things are of God. That's what he says about us. That, that is a new identity. That's a switch that he allows me to enter into. And I've got to change my thinking to do that. Just like in the evil side, people have to change their thinking to say, I'm not a male, I'm a woman. Or I'm not a woman, I'm a, I'm a man. Well, in this way, in spiritual ways, God says, I'll let you do this one because I've done this. I literally have moved you to another family and I've given you a new identity. And one of those identities that we're going to talk about is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. We're going to look at it in the New Testament. Let's start here. Matthew chapter 3. This is John the Baptist speaking. Pharisees have come out. They don't like the fact that thousands of people are going out to see John the Baptist in the wilderness. Good grief, this isn't easy, this is hard. Yet God is moving on people, they're coming out in droves, and they're being baptized in a baptism of repentance. God is calling them to stop living for themselves and start living for God. And it's preparing their hearts to be ready for Jesus to come. And so this move is going on, and they come out, and John identifies, what are you doing here? You, you want to be part of this baptism of repentance? Then he says this. Well, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. You're coming out here looking in on us? If you're going to be a part of it, you're going to have to do something that looks like it. This is a baptism of repentance. So bear fruit of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That's good enough. He says... For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to, the, to Abraham from these stones. What, what is John, John talking about? He's talking about this invisible, multidimensional God who can do anything. God, God could raise up. That, that, that's not your connection with God, that you're the physical grand something of Abraham. That's not your connection. It's the spiritual connection. He's saying God can, God can do anybody with that. That's not your salvation. Keep going. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear what? Good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So here's John the Baptist saying, we'll know you by what, we'll know who you are by what you do. We can identify who you're with by what you do. Keep going. Matthew 7. Verse 16, this is now Jesus speaking. You will know them by their fruits. Well, if he's going to be judge of the world, anybody who should be the expert on this one, it should be Jesus. If you and I will be judged by him correctly, 
If anybody should know how we identify true believers, it ought to be Jesus. And he says, you will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears what? Good fruit. And the bad tree bears what? Bad fruit. My identity in Christ is to be a, a branch that bears fruit. That's, that's my identity. That's who I am. I need to understand that. I need to think about it. I need to live it. Keep going. For a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, here it comes again, is what? Is cut down and thrown into the fire. So now it's not just John the Baptist saying it, it's Jesus saying it. Remember, God is a fire. For the saint, it's a blessing, purification. For the lost, it is torment. The presence of God is either a blessing or agony. And he says... Those that don't produce are cut and thrown into the fire. Therefore, because of this, therefore, because of that, Jesus, the judge of the whole world, says, by their fruits you will know them. So how many of you think it's important that we bear fruit if we say we're his? All right, how many of you think it's important that we bear fruit if we say they are his? Yeah. That ought to be going on in my life. Oh, wow. Some of you may come in and say, well, I'm kind of a sitter, not a doer. Well, we've heard about them in the Bible too. He says, you lazy, no good servant. I gave you talents, you buried them in the sand. You bore no fruit. And guess what happens to that one? They're kicked out. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not a good thing. That's not like the lowest part of heaven. <laughs> so he identifies it. He tells us this. We are to be branches bearing the fruit of the kingdom, the things of God. Keep going. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. I love this because this is Jesus just saying, look, you're not going to serve two masters. Get over it. You're either going to love one and hate the other. You cannot have two masters. And either make the tree good or make the tree bad. Isn't he the one that said, let the righteous be unrighteous still. Let the righteous be righteous still. In other words, you are who you are. And we, if we are in Christ, we need to identify as the tree that bears fruit. Make it bad or make it good, for a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart. We're, we're told to meditate and take time with God. We're, we're told to set aside and, and, and be with Him, get to know Him. We're told to study the Word, to show ourselves approved. We're told to have interaction with him because what is that doing? That's giving me something into my heart. And then out of this heart, the mouth is going to speak. And somebody might say they're, they're with the Lord, but their mouth can reveal they're not. Their actions can reveal they're not. It doesn't matter what they say. You know, we're in a political season right now. Politicians are saying a lot. I've heard a lot of scriptures lately from almost every politician. How many of them got a mask on? And let them talk long enough, it'll expose what's really in the heart. And you can look at what they've done. And they, they may have done something for a long time, but then suddenly an election comes, they tell you they're going to do something else. So which one, should you, which one should you look at? What they've done and the fruit of what they've done or what they say they'll do? Oh, believe me, I'm promising right now this is what I'll do. Yeah, but your fruit says you don't do that. Your fruit says you're a whole nother person. Delaware voting has now started, hallelujah. Gail and I are going to vote early. I like this voting early stuff. I really do. I'm responsible for my vote. God gave it to me. Delaware didn't give it to me. The United States didn't give me a vote. God gave me a vote. And I'm accountable to God. And he's supposed, I'm supposed to have a relationship with him, and I'm accountable to what I do with it. Well, praise God, Gail and I are going to vote early, and we're going to do our best to listen to God and do accordingly. 
it said like over 50% of the Christians didn't even vote last season. Well, my dear, I hope the least the people of Crossroad all vote. If you're in voting rage, I hope we all vote. I hope we understand. We've talked about authority long enough to know if God gives you a vote, that's authority He commissioned to you and you need to do right by your authority. So listen to God and go vote. That is part of your fruitfulness. See, then our whole community can be blessed because people are listening to God and we're going ways that God is asking. And maybe there'll be more righteous people within the government not making crazy laws. We've got some wonderful politicians right here in this fellowship who have to spend most of their political time just trying to stop the crazy laws they're trying to pass. Come on, church, do you hear me? It's sad that that's what they have to do, but they're always standing up and feeling even sometimes people who say they're believers aren't with them. They're doing ungodly things right there. We need godliness. So at least let us use the vote that God gives us to be able to point toward God. Amen. Bear the fruit that we're supposed to be bearing. Keep going. Matthew 12, verse 30. To five there. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. A good man out of the good treasure. You know what treasure? That stuff that's stored up. It's, it's stored up. God wants you to be with him and get things stored up. He, we, he wants you to walk with him so things get stored up so that you can have this explosion of what God can do. You know, I've, to, I've told this story before, but Gail and I, when we got married, I was, I was in Goshen Methodist Church. She was in Grace Missionary Alliance, both in Milton. We were Milton people. We were in a Milton church. And, and when we got married, we go, okay, well, do we feel like God's saying one or the other? So we went to church at Goshen Church because they had Sunday morning church. Then we went to Grace Church because they had Sunday night church and Wednesday Bible study. So for a while, we were in both those churches kind of just waiting on God. Then one day the Lord tells me, you're supposed to go up to Milford Church of God. Milford Church of God. And, uh, and, and I'm like, he, he just told me to go to a foreign country. I've always gone to church in my own hometown. I haven't gone, I don't know if I, you know, I rarely ever went to church outside of my town. Now he's telling me that I'm going to be doing that. He might as well told me to go to a foreign country. So I tell Gail, and she was real happy. <laughs> no, she wasn't happy at all. She was like, what are you talking about? We're, 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 this is wonderful. We're with both our families, and it's wonderful. What, what are you messing with? I said, well, God said. Well, she wasn't happy about it, and it took three weeks for God to do a miracle, a miracle move, a miracle word, and, and then we, we were convinced to go up there. I've told that story before. So... On the very first day we're riding to Milford, Church of God, I just asked, you know, while, while you're in the midst of following God, you might as well ask the next question. I said, so Lord, what do, you, what do you want us to do up there? And right away the Lord responded back and said, nothing. I want you to watch, listen, and learn. Not from Milford, Church of God, from God. Meaning he was going to say, that's of me, that's not of me. This is what I want. That's not what I want. He was using them to expand me beyond where I was, think, to learn things about the Spirit, things about God, and, and not to say rubber stamp, what the, but to teach me so he could show me his heart and who he is. And you know how hard it is for me to go somewhere and not do anything? I mean, I, was, I, I, mean, I went up there with Donnie and Irene Calhoun. Well, I sang with them for a couple years in a gospel group. So, you know, as soon as I show up there and they, and they say, you're going to church here? Well, they're saying, well, join the praise team. Join the choir. Whatever they asked me to do that was connected to the church, I said no. I said no. In the meantime, God is there and he is. He's pouring into me. I'm learning. I'm going to every service. They had extra, everything they did, I went to. And God is pouring into me. And I'm not doing anything. And I'm telling you, it's like, huh. You know, I felt like the Dead Sea. I was being poured into and wasn't being poured out. I, mean, I was just like loading up. And we were there about a year. And then on this one Sunday, the pastor called us out of the Sunday school. 
me and Gail, called us out and he brought us into his office and he said, you know what? I've been talking to the teachers. They said, man, in the, that adult class, your responses and all that, they said, obviously you, you know the Lord and you could do this and we need somebody new and fresh to come into that thing. We'd like you to teach the adult Sunday school at Milford Church. Well, that's like the second highest place of teaching in the whole church. And you might as well said, sick them to a dog. Because I'm like, I'm ready for that. That's awesome. That's, that's everything I want. And, and they said to Gail, it looks like you really do care about kids and all that, and we'd like you to get involved in the, the Sunday school program. And so uh, I, I'm like, you know, this, this is everything we're trying to get to, yet God had not told us anything different except to go listen and learn. Not to do. So, so here the pastor is offering us in his office, and I look over at Gail, and Gail looks over at me. We already know the answer. I turned back and said, Pastor, that's everything I want. That's everything I desire to do. And the answer is no. Because God said, and he's not told us anything different. I did not know that was going to be the last Sunday I was going to be at that church. Matter of fact, well, you think about this. To me, that was like the last test. God had been teaching me stuff, pouring stuff into me. And I think he said, now before I do anything else with Rick Betts, I got to test him one more time. And he, I believe he moved on that pastor's heart to offer me the moon, to offer me everything I wanted. Because later on, that pastor went out to lunch with Pastor Bill and he told him, he said, I really think Rick Betts missed it, missed God. And I believe he thought I missed God because I believe God moved on his heart to ask me to do that. So he could test me to see, just one more test, is he still willing to obey me over what he desires? Because literally that man was giving me everything I had in my heart, a desire to do for God. But how many of you know, you may have a desire to do something for God, but you still got to listen to God. Just because somebody's offering you those desires doesn't mean that's your time, unless God says so. So I said no to him, and we went home, and, and that week, Gail's church, where she had grown up, Grace Church, was having a revival. Well, we were doing this anyway. We would have gone at the invite, and it, was, it wasn't at regular service time, so it was Monday through Friday. And so we went to that revival they were having just to honor her, her parents and everything. Well, by Friday, I came home after Friday night and, and I told Gail, I said, I feel like the Lord has uh, told us that it's time to go back to grace. And she said right to me, I felt the same thing. Well, I said, well, let's not do what we did last time we left churches and made God do something to get us to move. Let's get on our knees right now. We got there right on the, at the bedside and we prayed and said, Lord, we believe you're saying you want us to go back to grace. So, Lord, last time you did stuff to, to get us up there, you don't have to do anything. Sunday morning, we're going to be at Grace Church. Now, if you want to do something, that's fine. That, that, that would be encouraging, I guess. But you don't have to because Gail and I both agree we've heard you. And I said, Sunday morning, you're going to find us at Grace Church. That was Friday night. On Saturday morning, I went down to my dad's business and I start working and then the phone rings about 8 o'clock and it's Gail. And she said, Rick, my grandmother just called and she said last night God woke her up three times. Each time when, she was, when God woke her up, she said, Lord, what do you want? And each time she said, he said, tell Rick and Gail in the morning they're supposed to go to, to Grace Church. So I don't know anything else about except that, honey. I'm telling you, God said three times, tell Rick and Gail, you're going to Grace Church. And she calls me up, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. He didn't have to do anything, but now we knew we're, we're in the right place. So Sunday morning, we're headed to that church, and we get about halfway there, and I hear the Lord say, when you get there, I want you to stand up and say this scripture. I hadn't been in that church for over a year except for that revival. And now he's telling me I'm going to speak in the first service. Well, I, I've told that story before too and how it freaked me out. And 
But God had a perfect moment and a perfect time that it happened. And the end result of me speaking was the altars filled up. There wasn't any room at the altars. And they were like three rows back of people that were trying to get to the front to the altars. And and we had people last night and, and this morning that, that were at Grace at that time. I don't know if we've got anybody here today that was at that service at Grace Church. But I ended up praying for all these people across the the the, the altar. And then I went out into the rows and 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 got to the last row and and I was back in the leaning I, I was tired by that point and I'm I had my hand on the, the side of the pew just looking at all the people at the altar and all the activity that was going on. And I felt a tug on my sleeve and I turned around. It was Janie Spencer, eighty some years old. Had Coke bottle glasses. You know what I'm talking about? Like the bottom of Coke bottles, just thick glasses, old, old time back in the 80s and she's tugging on my sleeve and, and I turn around and see her and she's got tears running down her face and and she sees all the activity at the altar and all these people and everybody praying and crying and she's crying and she's pulling on my sleeve and she says you you see that boy right there and you see that boy right there and you see it and she goes names five men four in their 40s to her they're just boys She's pointing out people at the altar getting saved. And she said, you see that boy right there, and that boy right there, and that boy right there. And she's going like, and she says, I've been praying for these boys all my life. And today, today, God's answered my prayer. And suddenly at that moment, you get it. It's not about you. It's not about anything you can do or whatever. It's about God's heart and God's plan. He he loved all those people that came up to the altar. He loved all those men that were getting saved. He loved Janie Spencer. He loved me. And we're getting to see simply what? The fruit of the kingdom. And where did that come from? God said, go up there for a year. I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to build a treasure trove of stuff in you. And I'm, I'm telling you, don't say anything. I'm pouring it in because there's a, there's a moment I'm going to pour it out. And when I got to that church and I'm headed to that church, he says, you say these words. And then God does the incredible. And a church has a move that that's, the fruit is still going on to this day. And what does he say? Out of the treasure. Because God will pour in treasure. For what purpose? To bear fruit. Why do we get with him to be able to bear fruit? Does it happen on our time? Not always, but we bear fruit of the kingdom. God's doing something. Even if you're being held back, even if he tells you, hold back and learn right now, it's because he's pouring in a treasure that one day it's going to burst forth and you're going to say, Woo, look at all the fruit that's come out of that. God's got a plan. He always does. You can always trust him and depend on him. And evil men out of the evil treasure of their heart. They, we pile in stuff too that's evil. And that'll bear stuff. You, you're hiding out. You think nobody knows, but you're meditating on the wrong thing. And, and man, it's going to come out in ways you, you won't believe. When I've had people in there counseling with me and they said, Pastor, I don't know how I did it. And I just go to there. I say, oh, I know how you did it. You thought about the wrong thing for a long time. Then you finally did the wrong thing. You meditated on it. You studied on it. You watched the wrong things. You did whatever. And then it bore its fruit. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, will they will give account of on the day of judgment. Why every idle? Because every word is connected to, to, to where we're at, either good or bad. Keep going. By your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. I cannot justify myself by anything I do. Jesus justified me on the cross, but the revelation that I'm connected with him will come out of my mouth. If I know him, I'll confess him as Lord. If I know him, I I will walk with him as my Lord and Redeemer and listen to him. If I don't, then that too will come out of my mouth, that I'm not following, that I'm not honoring him. So by the words, you will see who, who I am. It'll either justify me or condemn me. But once again, it's like Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. Amen.
This is Jesus talking. Keep going. Now, Matthew 13, verse 23. But he who receives seed on the good ground. So what is it talking about? This is the parable of the sower. And if you remember, there's four types of ground that it's, it's spoken about. The first one is the hard ground. The hard ground. And I always thought it's amazing. The sower sowed seed on the hard ground. Now, doesn't God know that's hard ground? Nothing's going to happen to it. But the Bible says he desires that how many would be saved? All. Oh. So even those that are going to reject him get the word of God. Do what? That a Savior has come, died on the cross for their sins. Even they get the gospel. They're not going to receive it. But he gives it to them anyway because his desires all would come to repentance. Yet they're going to not even hear it. Not even You know some of those people, they're so hard they can't even hear the word right now. Thank God every now and then some of them get broken up. But when that, hard, that, when that ground is hard, they can't do anything with the gospel. And then you got the other, which is stony ground. That means there's enough room for that plant to go forth, but it'll never produce the fruit of the kingdom. And he says, just for a little while. It blooms for a little while. Because, you know, there's lots of people that are excited to hear they can go to heaven and miss hell. Oh, that's exciting. Yes, 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 yes. But now I got to live for him? I got, he's got to be my Lord? I've got, I got to be obedient to him. I have to have interaction with him. i got to bear fruit for him. Oh, that's too much. My family didn't like that I got saved anyway. My family and my friends, I lost some friends, and I want my friends back. The Bible said when persecution comes, they give it up, and guess what they don't do? They don't bear fruit. Then you got the third type of ground, which was the ground that actually started to grow. It actually started to grow. You could see it coming up, but then the thorns and everything choke it out. And it, what, what does it do? It, it doesn't bear fruit either. They got involved with the cares of this life. I've seen them. I've had youth that were excited with me. I got saved with other people that went through the same processes. Yet when life came, they left the gospel because, man, they got into life. They had a job now. They were making money now. And they forgot all about God. The cares of this world. And what happens? They don't bear the fruit. But who are, who's the good ground? The good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. Then we see the variety of the production, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. See, you're going to have all that from, from whatever 1% is to 100%. You're, you're going to have it all in the kingdom. But how many of you know we bear fruit? We bear fruit. That's who, that's who we are. That's who I am. Keep going. Luke 13, verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? So that's pretty understandable. It's wasting room for everybody else. Get it out of the way so those that will bear fruit can be here. But look what the keeper says. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Let me give it one more chance. Let's try one more time. Let's do what we can. Let's cut down some of those roots in the wrong place. Let's put fertilizer. How many of you love stinky fertilizer on you? But God will do everything he can to get you to be part of the kingdom. He'll dig you up. He'll put stinky fertilizer on you. Giving you one more chance. But, but listen. Listen. And if it bears fruit, then well. But if not, after that, you can let it go to heaven. No, but if not, after that, we cut it down. Why is that? Because whether you know it or not, brother or sister, we bear fruit. My identity is a fruit bearer of what? Of the kingdom of God. We bear fruit. You will know them by their fruit. I am a child of the king, and I'm going to live like a child of the king. I will produce the kingdom.
I will produce the life of God. This is my identity. This is what I should be thinking about, meditating on, to let the Holy Spirit do His work to be able to produce the kingdom. The Holy Spirit pouring in, uh, and my factory produces what? The kingdom of God, the fruit of the kingdom of God. Keep going. We'll end with this. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Everything is about Jesus. He's the one who started it all. We were made by Him, for Him, and through Him. Everything's about Jesus. Before anything was, He was to create. He spoke the word out. Let there be light. He was the one who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He was the one who spoke to Moses face to face. He was the one who met Joshua as the commander of the host of heaven. He was the one who told Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. Then the pre-incarnate Christ, as we call him, was conceived in the womb of Mary. We don't see that pre-incarnate Christ now. We see this one who was born among us. Now it's God with us, Emmanuel. And he grew and he represented us. He died for us, was put on that cross to take away our sin, representing now it is finished, the last payment for what Adam had done. But when he rose from the dead, this was all brand new now. He's the first of the many more to come. He is the head of the new creation. This is the change. This is the new identity. And now anybody who is in him has a total switch of family. We've been moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Everything's about Jesus. Everything. So he says, I'm the vine. I'm the vine. And my father is the vine dresser who watch over the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Interesting that the branch is in them, even if they're taken away. This, this is sometimes where, uh, you know, pe people don't agree with what I say, but I believe Jesus came for us all. It's hard for God to have a desire for everybody to be saved if he makes no provision for everybody to be saved. And so I believe those things. I remember when I was in a van with my brothers in the Lord, but, but they were talking about a limited atonement, of that Jesus' blood was only shed for the believer, not for the unbeliever. And they were, they were saying why they believe that. And, 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 and they said the... Uh, you know, they didn't know why God chose them and let everybody else go to hell, but, but they were glad that that blood was shed for them. And so I just, I just asked the question. I said, guys, it sounds like this is w what you're saying and all that, but so I said, so, so you believe Jesus bought you with his blood? And, and they said, yes, yes, he bought us with his blood. I said, therefore, now he's your master. And now he can judge you. He can, because he bought you. And they, they were saying yes and all that. I said, then, I said, then my question is, what right does Jesus have to judge the lost people? If he didn't buy them, why is he going to be their judge too? I said, either he bought the whole batch or he didn't buy any of us. If he bought the whole batch, he gets to judge us all. And now every knee must bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, so it's not about God not making provision for that. It's about people refusing to receive it. I said, therefore, if he did die for the world, he can offer to the hard ground the seed of the gospel. He can say he has a desire and he made provision for that desire that all the world would be saved. Well, if he didn't die for anybody's sin, then how can he have a desire that they would be saved? But if it's not about the sin anymore, it's now about who you love. And, of course, the van got really quiet. And then they changed the subject. <laughs> nobody, had a, nobody had an answer for what I said, but they're still my brothers. and you know, it, it, that, I, I love my brothers, and, and they're there. I just didn't agree with them on that point because I see God loving all of us. I see him grieving over a lost, wicked person. We, you know... You know, when they said Saddam Hussein was dead and everybody's died, and when, uh, what's his name, Bin Laden was killed and everybody just jumping up and down because one man, 
I wasn't happy. You know, that if he didn't come to Christ, he was lost. And I felt my God instead of our jubilant celebration that a wicked man was dead. Maybe you don't understand that, but, but I understood it. I, I, I'm learning how to love the world even if, they don't, even if they don't love me back. I had somebody tell me, he says, yeah, I, I told somebody where I, where I went to church. I went to Crossroad. And they said, oh, they checked him out online. Apparently you're not woke enough for him. I said, I'm pretty sure I'm not. I don't identify with woke. I identify with Jesus. I don't identify with the confusion that's going on. I identify with the sound mind and who my Lord and my Savior is. And I'm, I'm going to keep doing it even if people check us out online and don't, don't like what they see. I'm not trying to present me. I'm trying to present our Lord and Savior and His love for the whole world, even in our confusion. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Oh, happy day. Ha! Happy day. How many are bearing fruit for the kingdom of God out there? Oh, half of you. How many are bearing fruit for the kingdom of God out there? Watch out. You're about ready to get pruned. Why? to be more productive, right? To bear more fruit. So what on earth is my heavenly Father happy about? Only when I have my identity, which is a fruit bearer. That's when He's happy. And when I bear fruit, then what happens? He prunes me to bear more fruit. He doesn't mind putting us through a little bit of trouble. He doesn't mind. If, if it's going to bear more fruit, he's okay with it. He'll walk with us in trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You will too. But it's to bear fruit. He's cleaning away that old stuff, that stuff that's hindering fruit. And bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Now, he says that, but he also said that, remember, at the Lord's Supper. He told Peter that, didn't he? He said, you're already clean by the word I spoke to you. He said, what, what's necessary is you, you let me do this. Listen, this is part of the vine. He's the vine, and what does a branch need to bear fruit? It needs to have the life of the vine interacting with that branch. If the life is cut off, then that branch withers. It doesn't produce, and it's going to be cut off. So we need the life of God to be interacting with me. He says, Look, listen, you've been cleaned by the Word, but now we've got to have interaction, or you'll die. You'll die on the vine. We've got to have interaction. What is this cleaning? All right, well, I'm not of the world, but I'm in the world. And when I go, in, when I go out in the world, guess what? The world gets on me. I'm sorry. I wish, I wish we could make it easier, but the world's out there, and it gets on us, church. Pick up your phone. You don't even want the commercial to come, and the commercial comes. You go, go, go home and watch football, and in between there's going to be commercials that are going to tell you about Halloween movies, and you better watch your grandkids or they're going to see somebody's head get cut off or Something else is just a bunch of hard junk that they've got on there all the time. The world is out there and it gets on us. What does Jesus say? Uh, I cleaned you by the, the word for that, but I need to wash your feet. I, I need to get what? The dirt of the world off of you. Remember, he says, if you confess your sin to me, I'm faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'll keep you where you need to be to bear fruit because that's what we do in the kingdom. We bear fruit. But if you will not fellowship with me, you're going to dry up and you're going to die. You're going to stop bearing fruit. And then what happens? You're cut off and taken away. Keep going. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. What is this abiding? This is abode. This is living with. Uh, listen, Jesus isn't just a side thought. I live with him. He's in my thoughts. He's in my conversations. He, he's in my decisions. 
Every decision I'm making ought to be connected with the God I'm walking with. And how do we do this today, Lord? And hey, how are we going to talk to that one? And hey, and you know, Gail asked me the other day, can you go with me and want to do something she wanted to do? And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I was tired. It's been a long week. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And, uh, and she's like, all right, and she's in the bedroom. I go out, sit down, and go, I don't want to do that. I finally got some time to myself, you know, all about me. And I'm sitting out there, but the problem is it's not all about me. I'm connected to the vine. And I'm sitting out there and say, all right, your wife is asking something. You're her husband, and you need to hear her. You need to respond to her. And I'm just like, okay, Lord. I get up, I walk into the bedroom. All right, what time are we leaving? What time are we have? <coughs> she might have think she won. She didn't win. God did. Because we're abiding. We, we have our abode together. I'm in fellowship with her. And she was asking, and no, I did not want to go. And I, I can't even say I was that thrilled that I did it all. But I knew I was in the right place. I knew I was doing the right thing. And you know what? You, you can tell your flesh to shut up and just get over it. So, yeah. But why is that? It's because we're, we're living together. We're abiding with one another. We, we're interacting. And so the life of God is moving and flowing and Come on, do you understand? And, and when you listen to it, it, it keeps that life going. You know, somebody talked to me and they said, uh, yeah, my grandkids came over. I had them for a couple hours ago. Thank God I can send them home. I'm like, I can't send them home. My grandkids are living with me. Andrew's allergic to his house. Thankfully, up above my garage, he's not allergic to that, so he's up there. But I can't send the grandkids home. They stay with me all the time. They are aboding with me. <laughs> and you know what? That changes things. And I'm like, you know, Pop-Pop doesn't just get a couple hours here and then I'm tired, go home. No, they're there in the morning. It's kind of funny. If, if, if our bedroom light comes on, they want to start knocking on the door. Can we come in? Can we come in? Right up to the moment they go to sleep. When I, when I leave here, as soon as I open the door, hey, Papa! Hey, Mama! Sometimes it's, it's hey, oh, it's only Papa, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I know that responsibility. I know the responsibility I'm in. It's not going to be even the same for my other grandkids that aren't in my house. These grandkids are with me all the time, and we're inputting, and, and the life is going on. I know the life of me is getting into them, and this is just the, the time God's given us. You know, in my selfishness, would I be happy if it was different? Yeah, probably. But that's not what he's given us. He's got a plan. He's doing something in their life, in our life. There's something that we don't even see yet that's going to be bearing fruit for the kingdom of God that's beyond anything we can think or ask or, or expect. You know, Andrew's going through a pruning right now in his life, but I'm telling you, there's treasure being stored up, and every time we get to here, we know something's going on of what God is doing, and, and we're in the midst of it. Because we are fruit bearers, and we're going to be that. And, and it's how? Because we're abiding with God. It affects our life. It affects our families. It affects everything around us. We are fruit bearers of the kingdom of God. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So without relationship, I can't be my identity. With it, I can bear much fruit. When, when it says in that scripture that whatever doesn't bear, the vine dresser takes it away. I, I think it was Secrets of the Vine the first time I heard an author say, that doesn't mean cut off or take away. It means to lift up. And they were so happy to say it means lift up. Because who wants to tell somebody that you'll be taken away? You'll be cut off. Who, who, who wants to say that? 
And I, I saw him say that, and I thought, there's so many scriptures that don't agree with that, but I'm going to study this and, and look at it. And, and I looked, and in the Strong's, the very last word identifying what, what it, all the things it could be was to lift up. And I'm saying, well, that's a stretch to take it that far. But uh, when you go into the, the, the Old Testament for the, the words and the New Testaments for those words, when you go to that and they individually just dissect that word for that one place, it, guess what it was? It was cut. It was take away. It was to cut. To me, to me, it was obvious. But we just, we just don't want to say those things to people. We want to be so nice. Keep your sin and thank God you're, just, you're okay. And, and God says, Jesus himself, listen, I'll know you're with me because you're going back. What, is, what does the bride of Christ in Revelation, what does the bride of Christ have, have on? The fruit. They're dressed in the fruit of the kingdom, the, the righteous acts of the saints. That's what they're dressed in. How can you get to be the bride of Christ if you don't have the fruit of the kingdom? So we were in Israel and... Uh, Riding in the bus, I was with 50 other pastors taking a tour in Israel. We were coming from Nazareth, headed to Jerusalem. And uh, one of the pastors up front grabbed the mic, you know, that microphone they got for the bus. And he gets on there. He says, hey, guys, I just was reading the other day. I just wanted to tell you, I was reading about the vine where it says those that don't bear fruit are taken away. And he said, it doesn't mean cut or whatever. It means to lift up. And, and said the farmer would take a stick and prop that thing up or they'll put a stone under it so it's not on the ground so it'll bear fruit. And of course, I think any good agriculture person knows if you put a vegetation on a stone, it's going to burn it up. It's not going to keep it anything. But anyway, he was saying all this. So, so I just wanted to tell you all that because that's, that's, that to me, that was just wonderful. So we're riding to Jerusalem. Suddenly we hit the vineyards. And I'm looking out. And it says, sure does look like vineyards to me. And they're all trimmed up. All those bottom branches are gone. And they got people. They, they, all these people are out in the fields. And they had fires everywhere. You could see like four or five fires going up on this side. Four or five fires on that side. And I thought, oh, I got to go talk to our, our Jewish guide, Yoshi. I said, I got to. So I walk all the way up to the aisle. He's sitting in the well. So I step down in the well with him. I said, Yoshi, aren't these vineyards here? He says, oh, yeah, these are all the vineyards and everything we got here in Israel. It's wonderful. I said, so what's... What are all the people out there, and what's all the fires? And Yoshi, he looks this way because he's sitting in the well. You know, we're driving this way. He's sitting in the well, and I'm beside him. He looks here because the preacher's like two, two seats up. So he looks to see if he's listening. And then he leans over and whispers in my ear. He said, they cut all those bottom branches off because they'll never bear fruit. And he said, they pile them up and burn them just like they're doing there, just like your scriptures say. I thought, isn't it interesting? The Jewish tour guide believes our scriptures better than our Protestant preachers. Church, we bear fruit. We bear fruit. That's my identity. That's your identity. We are fruit bearers. We don't walk away from that. We identify as that. This is who we are. How can we say we're in the kingdom if we will not bear the fruit of the kingdom? Now watch. Keep going. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If he abides in me and my words abide in him, abode and live and interflow and interact and the life of the vine is flowing into that branch, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I love that because when I'm flowing with him, I'm no longer asking the dumb things and ask a miss of things. I'm now asking the things God would have me ask. I'm now praying for the things God would have me do. I now can say things and pray for things because he's leading, guiding, or even telling me what's going to go on in the future. So I understand far better of how to communicate with God and get the desires of what we are saying. By this, we'll end with this, by this my Father is glorified. Glorified. Who's the Father? He's the multidimensional, invisible spirit so high, we'll never know him. Just like Jesus said, we've never seen him because he's too 
hard to know in the sense of, of that. He, 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 we can't understand his dimension. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me. But watch. But when you and I bear fruit, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. When you and I are our identity, when you and I bear fruit, the invisible God is now seen in His sons and His daughters. The world can know and sense who the invisible God is when you and I are bearing the fruit of the kingdom. Do you understand? You don't get the kingdom if you're not a son or daughter of the kingdom. And if you are a son and daughter of the kingdom, then you are the fruit that reveals who your father is. By this we will know. By this you will be my disciples. Only when you're bearing fruit. Thank God he loves us. Thank God he's patient with us. But in the end, only those who bear fruit are in the kingdom of God. Why don't you stand? All right, praise God. I hope I didn't blow your mind. But, but that's why we quote Jesus, so he can blow your mind. So he can define who we are. If we're going to talk about identity, we've got to talk about the real stuff, not, not stuff that makes you feel good. Stuff that's real. Stuff that's his language of how he speaks to us. We are branches that bear fruit if you're in the kingdom. That's my identity, to bear fruit. I'm going to have seven days before I get back here. What do you think I want to do? I want to bear some fruit, right? Bear some fruit. Bear some fruit. Somebody may be here right now and they know it's time for me to get connected to the vine. It's time for me to start letting the life come into me. The Spirit has told me I'm not in the right place and today I'm ready to let Jesus be Lord of everything. If God has done that for you, then brother, sister, I can lead you in a prayer of you committing your heart, your life to him. Your brothers and sisters that have done it, they'll be happy for you. They'll say the prayer and support. But you have to identify with Christ. You have to be able to confess him as Lord and Savior. You have to be willing to raise a hand and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. If that's you today, you know you need to let him be Lord and Savior of your life. Then raise that hand. We'll say this prayer with you. Anybody in the room that needs that, raise your hand up high right there. I see that one. I see that one. I see those two hands over there. Amen. Two hands over there. Anybody else? Right here. We got a hand right there. Amen. Right there. Anybody else? Got a hand here. Got two hands there. Anybody else? All right. Praise God. Praise God. God knows why you've raised your hands, but we're going to say this prayer together, dedicating our hearts, our lives to him. If you were too afraid to raise your hand, Say this prayer anyway. Mean, th mean this prayer, and I hope you're not too afraid to go over here and have somebody pray with you. But let's say this prayer with them together. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. And the words I've heard, you have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now. Teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your word that as I do this, I can confess by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. Amen. I see Pastor Ken and Lynn right over here. Those of you that raise your hand, please, as soon as this service is over, go over. Let them pray with you. They want to invest in that decision. And if you don't have a fellowship, you got one here if you want it. But we all say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Amen.
All right, church, and now we got uh, seven days before we get back here. We're going to glorify the Lord. We're going to bear fruit. We're going to live for this kingdom. Are we going to have an expectancy that God is doing something in every single one of our lives? May he receive honor and glory for all of it. Amen. Lord, thank you for these ones that gave their hearts to you. Not only this service, but the other ones also. And thank you for your life in this body of Christ. Thank you for bearing fruit all over Del Marva about the kingdom of God. May you be glorified in your sons and your daughters. May the world see who you are through the acts that you inspire in your saints. We give you thanks that you've loved us this much that we could be sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. So now, Lord, go with each one of us and may we come back with incredible testimonies on our lips of the goodness of God. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen.